Welcome to Real Physics. Today I want to talk about science communication and in particular about Joe Rogan who is very interested in science and, well, I just love his podcast, See Why. You said a lot of wild shit. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sitting face to face with a US president and telling him he's saying wild shit requires certainly a lot of guts. And by the way, I believe if Joe Rogan had an education in physics, he would have become a great scientist because he has courage and common sense. See this one. Because people were tired of someone talking in this bullshit, pre-prepared politician lingo. Yeah, I think the problem is in science we have also kind of politicians. And maybe Joe Rogan is in contact with the wrong people. And yes, also in science you have this pre-prepared bullshit lingo when you talk to some science popularizers. And I stumbled upon this when I looked up a recent video with Brian Cox. Let's dive into that. Yeah, my general message beforehand would be don't fall for this science admirer lingo. How wonderful everything is. Just remain skeptical. Yeah, by the way, I don't want to attack him personally. Maybe he's a nice guy, Brian Cox, but in general, I can't stand people with this permanent frozen grin in your face. Because tell me something interesting that elicits my fascination rather than adopt this parroting admiration. There is a famous quote by the German physicist Georg Christoph Lichtenberg. I really like, he said, part of the fame of the most celebrated peoples always belongs to the foolishness of their admirers. And by the way, Cox is not an astrophysicist, he's a particle physicist. And I don't want to get into the details of the bullshit of particle physics here, but I mean, I think Cox at least understood that astrophysics is more sexy. So I think this is the true reason why he recently worked in astrophysics or in black holes. But let's now go to some funny details of that conversation. And it's really Rogan who is the smart one here asking the right questions. Listen. Which I think is profound and exciting. How is the progress being made? Like how, how do we how do we study a black hole? I mean it's mainly theoretical. So he said, tell me about the progress. How is this measured? Excellent question. And the answer is, okay, theoretically, how do we observe it? Theoretically, that already tells you almost everything about this conversation. So we have two photographs. We show photographs? Radio telescope photographs. Right. One of the, the one in the center of our galaxy, which is a, a little one. It's called Sagittarius A star. A little, it's, a, it's a little supermassive black hole. So it's about six million times the mass of the sun. Okay, if you're talking about the black hole in the center of our galaxy, it's not a photograph to begin with. And it's four million times the mass of the sun, not six, but anyway. But let's say this is still good science and the Nobel was awarded in 2020 for this remarkable discovery of, we should be precise, a huge mass concentration, which evidently does not emit radiation. And then there's another one, the first photo that was taken, it's a collaboration called Event Horizon. And they took a, a photo of one in the galaxy M87. No, this is at least highly misleading, if not patently wrong. There was much ado about the black hole in the M87 galaxy, but let's say this was never a clean picture of a black hole. It was a highly theory loading interpretation of a intransparent mass of data nobody could independently analyze and replicate. Yes, there was one who did. It's in this paper here. And I don't want to go into the details here, but you can look up the video by my friend Pierre-Marie Robitaille on Sky Scholar, who quoted that paper and went a little bit into more detail why this is not a genuine discovery. And by the way, talking about these two black holes in our galaxy and in M87, I like to entertain the idea that the Nobel was awarded for the measurements in our galaxy to underscore this is good science in contrast to the highly publicized M87 so-called picture. They made a big fuss about this in the conference, but as I said, it's not clean science. What hurts me a little bit is here Joe Rogan's Wow, oh, wow, oh, oh my God. Please remain skeptical. Most of this are still fairy tales. Larger than our solar system basically, oh this my thing God. that sits in, in a galaxy. So we've got these two photographs. Larger than our solar system. Yeah, the event, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a big, 
structure. Yeah, I should add here something. The entire story about black holes theory just highlights that physicists haven't thought that to the end because it's based on the assumption that the gravitational constant is a God-given number. And that's from a philosophical point of view, just preposterous. Again, don't want to go into the details here, you find enough material on my channel. But something is wrong here. You see it also that if you look at the density of the black hole, you would have this non-physical absurd densities if you consider small black holes. But if you consider density or say the size of the solar system, much admired by Brian Cox, it would just have the density of water. What is that? And that shows you that there is something preposterous in the idea of a black hole because the mass is proportional to the extension and not as any reasonable physical imagination would tell you proportional to the volume, which is proportional to the third power of the extension. Yeah, he now talks about this M87 picture and this is really highly misleading. And now he comes up with an even more preposterous claim. Listen. So that was a prediction uh, from Einstein's theory, basically, published it in 1915. And you can predict that that's one, what one should look like. And then just about, was that four years ago now, maybe five years ago, for the first time in history, we get an image of one and it looks like the prediction. Oh man, you Anglo-Saxons are sometimes so simple-minded. I mean, every enemy in your foreign policy is a Hitler and every science news you want to boost is a prediction of Einstein? No, this is patently false. There was no prediction whatsoever besides the desire to massage the data until you can interpret it as a black hole picture. Yeah, then he talks for a while about gravitational waves. And so that, that event, that, that process ripples space-time. So it sends ripples out in the fabric of the universe. Which is a shaky subject, but I want to go into the details another time. And then he comes to discuss Hawking radiation. And that's so important was that discovery. Then you go to Westminster Abbey in London, look on the floor of the Abbey, and he's in there next to Newton and Shakespeare and all these people, and he's yeah. there. No, sorry, that doesn't prove his accomplishments. It just shows the absurd cult of personality we observe in today's science. Hawking's so-called discovery was not significant by any means for fundamental physics, and that's why he wasn't even considered for the Nobel Prize during his lifetime. But Brian Cox now expands on this so-called information loss theorem and yeah let's just see. So it's this tremendously important discovery. Now it's not a tremendously important discovery. I mean you could even debate the evidence for black holes in the strict sense but I don't want to go into details about that. But certainly Hawking's idea if they exist they should a temperature is something entirely theoretically and if there is temperature well of course this is not new physics this is Planck 1900 then there should be radiation but you will never be able to measure that radiation because it's just nothing compared to the noise we inevitably have here so having a fancy theoretical idea about something you will be never able to measure is not good science and now he comes to this fancy subject of information loss, which is massaged by legions of theoretical physicists. Black holes destroy information. And that's a big deal. No, it's not a big deal. See what Sabine Hossenfelder says about this subject. I love her channel, by the way. It's far too weak to be measurable. In the absence of both theory and data, physicists made up lots of stories about what might happen in black hole evaporation. <laughs> I <laughs> love that. In, in the absence of theory and data, physicists made up a lot of stories. There is no better summary for these activities you can give. Maybe black holes don't entirely evaporate but leave behind remnants. Maybe information can't ever fall in. Maybe it bounces back at the singularity. Maybe it comes out with the radiation after all. Maybe it sits at the horizon. Maybe black holes aren't real. And so on. And then popular science writers like Brian Cox created this big mystery around it. Yeah, that's what I believe. If you think about fundamental physics, the information loss paradox is just a non-issue. So there never was any problem to begin with. I think they should have called their paper Much Ado About Nothing. 
And I also totally agree here. But the truth is that I don't really care because we'll never find out what the right answer is in any case. And even if we did, it wouldn't matter because it won't be useful for anything. So anyway, there is nothing to learn here from. And I can agree. Telling the problem was supposed to teach us something. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that there's nothing to be learned here about nature, even in the best case. It's not even philosophically interesting. It's just a bunch of theoretical <laughs> physicists fighting about whose math is the prettiest in a contest that will never be decided by data. So what's the point? Yeah, the analysis couldn't be more to the point. Yeah, when talking about all this wonderful progress in theory about black holes, I should mention, of course, that Roger Penrose got the Nobel Prize in 2020. But look at what the Academy wrote. It's very, very strange. He was able to describe black holes in detail. At their farthest depth, it's a singularity where all known laws of nature dissolve. I mean, what kind of insight is that? I would rather appreciate if you get the Nobel Prize for having understood the laws of nature, that certain laws of nature you were able to verify exist rather than there are no laws you can believe because everything is dissolved. I mean, what kind of justification is that? He's still an honest, very capable, serious scientist, and I highly respect him. But I also like to entertain again the idea that the Nobel was awarded a little bit for his harsh critique of string theory in this book. Because if the Nobel committee had a little bit of humor, that would be a subtle way to express that string theory is nonsense. Anyway, Penrose being a highly skilled mathematician, I still think he hasn't thought through this problem of black holes being related to the constancy of the gravitational constants, which is preposterous. Yeah, but coming back to Joe Rogan, I really think he is a smart person and he asks the right questions when he's confronted with that kind of fishy stuff. Listen. So it seemed that uniquely in the universe, black holes erase information. When you say there's no information, like how are you measuring whether or not there's information in it? So, so really in bits, I mean, the idea is, and, it's, and I should say it's very much in principle this, so no, no one thinks in practice you could reconstruct. Did you see that? <laughs> I mean, his question was to the point. How do you measure this concretely? How do you observe it? And the answer is, okay, it's a matter of principle. That means, no, you don't measure it. It's not science. So Joe, continue your questions, but be more skeptical with the answers. This is also a good question. Is it the end of time because all information is being erased, so there's nothing? Yeah, I mean, it's, is that the idea? If you draw the thing, you can draw a map of it, and it just literally time ends, according, just purely in Einstein's theory. This is 1915, his theory wow. of general relativity. Don't say wow, because he just bypassed your smart question with filibustering about Einstein's achievements 100 years ago. And now comes the most funny part. Rogan kind of asks, oh, we haven't figured out the rest. Is there so much we haven't understood? And the answer is preposterous. But it's just, just we haven't figured the rest of it out yet? Well, that's the thing. So we're starting to get hints about what might happen, which is, which is leading us. Yes, yeah, savor that. We're starting to get hints about what might happen, leading us to somewhere. This is, by the way, the correct facial expression you should adopt. And yes, unfortunately, there is this pre-prepared bullshit lingo also among science popularizers. So Joe, I would really appreciate if you maintain your straight language here by saying, what the fuck are you talking about? If you want to dive in more deeply into these topics, I have written two books, one about the fundamental problems we should consider and the way how we should tackle them, not planning of having a theory of everything. And the other one about the post-war scientific culture opposed to the natural philosophical point of view practiced in Europe messed up contemporary physics. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like it. And if you're interested in fundamental physics, subscribe to this channel.